What's up? How's it hanging, Tachibana? Huh? Oh, you made it too? Oh, of course. You know we gotta do this. What's up, my fellow ninjas? Seriously? Y'all kept your bodies? Lame. This week's King Oger continues off the hot fire of an episode that was last week, upping up the stakes from Dollar Store Tree Brand to Prime Rib Costco Meat. You can feel just how high quality this episode truly is, as it stands at the apex of all that came before. And if you can't comprehend sarcasm, I'm sorry, because... Yeah, no, th this episode just ain't it, y'all. Uh, also, sorry for being later than the usual upload, because doing those long-ass Godshard videos in the beginning of the week left me completely sleep-deprived. So, now that I've caught up on some sleep, here's some more of that there King Oger. Grody has unleashed the Fury of the Gods, and just as they try getting in that cheap shot, Doug that appears, dropping a neat lore-breaking reference once more. He reveals that Grody was responsible for destroying the Bugnarok's original planet, created just to be a killing machine, similar to Gira, with the remaining fleeing to the current planet, thus meaning that the humans weren't the invaders to the planets, but the Bugnaroks were all for the sake of entertainment. Thanks, I completely hate this now. But with the bad guy's exit, everyone now has to work together to make an evacuation plan and be able to handle the fury of the gods with zero casualties. Cool, so it's starting at Ishibana, so just summon God King Oger and beam spam the origin point. Simple. Oh, they want to focus on evacuation first before trying to deal with the bugs as opposed to dealing with them while they're at a centralized location? <sighs> Look, I can already tell you now that the comment section is going to tell you that you're overthinking things yet again. But I guess you can get away with it, huh? After all, you virtually walked out unscathed in the encounter with Cosmic Saber. Hey, listen now. You survived too. Yes, but at what cost? I even lost the lights of Orion! Okay, look. We're putting in too much movie lore into this King Oja review. It's not like the people who watch the King Oja reviews watch the Gotchard videos that I put out the other day. Oh, you're reviewing Gotchard again? Good for you. Carry on. Great, because Raculous is giving motivational speeches now, telling his former soldiers where he and the kingdom failed 17 years ago, in which they won't fail now. Also known as, we're gonna do shit this time and help folks with our resources. Let's just ignore that Raculous was just a child and being sat on by Doug Dead during the same time that this all was happening 17 years ago. No, no, let's just ignore that. Himeno gives her motivational speech while Yama's supercomputer projects the Fury of the Gods movement and lays down points for evacuation. With the extra time granted, the Boski also adds an escape route for Yanma and crew since he figured they were going to attempt being the last ones out to keep comms up. Even Raculous is out saving folks. At Gokon, we get reunited with BDSM Kruger and other jailmates trying to bust on out. Which is just what Rita needed. Because since these guys have already mapped out the underground, they're prime candidates to help everyone flee to the underground. Now how is everybody gonna get underground? Why, with the very same Ant Eater Tiller system the Boski went to jail for. Do we see it? Nope. Okay, are there massive holes in the ground now in each country big enough to allow Cicada Shoe Gods in? Absolutely. Are they just going to ignore it? Absolutely. Now, we finally see just how cooped up the land of the Bugnarok is. But everyone is making the most of things with folks from all countries just coexisting. Taking this opportunity, Jeremy addresses massive kingdom population of just seven bugs to show them the way that they should live is through being nice guys. Especially since all the bad ones are pretty much dead. Raculous gets some motivation from new wheelchair lady who loathed him for standing idle during the first Fury of the Gods. But with his words, earned his sword back and a seat at the grown folks table with the rest of the kings. 
And by that, I mean that he gets to pilot the god ant, while everyone else gets real shoe gods. Growing so massive that they defeat the entirety of the fury of the gods via beam spam. Giving us one final grody fight as he still longs for death. Even though he now has the immortality stone, that because now he's alive, he should not long for death because they made that a key plot point last week as to why he wanted death was because he was undead, but now he's alive. But, you know, uh, whatever, whatever, whatever. They grant his wish anyway! Only for the land of the dead to not be the peace and quiet that he longed for. While the world suffered zero casualties as the King Oger hovers oddly in the background. Rating time! So, to summarize, this episode is 95% evacuation to the 5% payoff with a very unsatisfying conclusion. This is the most fillery episode to ever filler, with so many holes in their plans that it shouldn't have gone as smoothly as it did. This did not build up the tension at all. The little development that Raculous had was completely not a necessity, and this episode should have either been a really short resolve in the beginning of the episode, or properly fleshed out in, say, like a two-parter or something. Really missed the ball on that one. The majority of this episode, honestly, could have been essentially skipped because of all those points. And thus, this episode is actually sinking my hype going into the end game. So it's gonna be getting one, two, three, four, five, five man F. So further tying in the connection between King Oger and Kyoruger, Doug did reveals that the Bugnaroks came from another planet that was essentially destroyed by Grody. In episode 22 of Kyoruger, Yayoi informs the cast that her father investigated a planet believed to have been destroyed by Debos prior to Earth. This planet had intelligent bug people, which means they are likely reaching to imply that this was the Bugnaroks' original planet. Which, yeah, look, that, that, that seems really cool on paper. But then you remember that it was stated in part one of King Oger that the Bugnarok took on their forms after consuming so many Shu God souls and that they coexisted with humans before Kamijin fucked everything up. Implying that they might have been physiologically similar enough because obviously how else would they conceive a child like Jeremy, thus showing us that possibly Bugnaroks had a human origin point until they just feasted on Shu God souls. So although this is a neat new Bugnarok explainer, we just got another retcon to pre-established lore. It's like, what's the point in telling us a backstory if you're just gonna change the backstory like episodes later? Grody's placement in the Land of the Dead and seeing that the future Don Bros crossover also takes place there makes me think that this is yet another setup for his return in the minisode. Who knows? Maybe Grody and Sonoi were sharing some netherworld noodles as Sonoi explains the true wonders of life? This episode honestly just doesn't give us much, as the majority of the episode was pretty much unnecessary. You look at the threat being the Cicada Chew Gods, which came from underground, mind you, in which people are just hiding underground, and you could also just send them underground, especially after you have some large newly made holes that lead there. But no, the King Oger obviously wasn't an option 17 years ago, but remember how it could travel across the world in mere seconds? Well, in this episode, it just grows twice as big and just beam spam. Something that technically could have been done within the first five minutes of the episode. Because, let's be real, did we actually see the Cicada Shoe Gods physically attack people when they showed a flashback 17 years ago? No, we never did. They always just hovered menacingly overhead, which is something that they did this episode. They just hovered menacingly overhead. Hell, even rain clouds do more damage than those shoe gods did. As for Grody being the threat himself, it wasn't really a thing. With all his empty promises just being reliant on the cicadas and a handful of Bugnarok, he honestly did more the folks last week than this week. I guess you could say that the major focus for this week was to further personify Raculous with Wheelchair Lady who, after hitting the floor, had them legs move just enough to make the act fall for me. 
they emphasize a lot on the zero casualties of it all. But then you remember that the last couple of weeks, the population of the planet appeared to be virtually non-existent. When you look back at like episode two and you see just how thriving Enkisopa was, and you see it now just be dwindled to less than 10 people in the cast, with the same being applicable to every nation, especially the Bugnarok, the stakes of having low casualties kind of loses itself. Obviously, I have issues with how the show continuously is retconning previous events, almost to the point that it feels like the head writer just didn't have it all planned out. The first half of this show was very, very cohesive storytelling. And although part two started off with a banger, it sort of started to fall apart soon after. Retreading on old ground with a new take that left more desired than what was presented. But we have reached the conclusion and... Now, the final arc of the show. Seemingly. So, let's see if they manage to stick the landing. As from the preview, it does seem that they might be planning something with the King Oger. And hopefully, it's just not a continuation of what we got this week with it just getting large. As that just means bigger and bigger sizing. I mean, I could see Bandai trying to release a perfect grade size King Oger where... I guess I gotta size comparison here for folks to understand. Let's say that the King Oger right now is the size of this 1144 scale model. And then you put it next to a 1100 scale model and you see the size difference. But I'm implying that they go from this to this. See? Massive, massive size difference. So now let's do some quick Photoshop magic and just take a superimposed picture of this and put it right next to it to show how big Toei could actually go. Hefty, hefty, hefty! Yeah, th this sucker's gonna cost a grand. But, as always, those are my thoughts. What are yours? What did you think about this week's King Oger? Evacuations, beam spams, and the loudness of the endless now. Anyway, that's it for me. Until next time, bye.